Let's pray. Heavenly Father, keep us connected to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I am the vine, you are the branches. Most of us know this. If nothing else, we know the song, I am the vine and you are the branches. Yeah, and we do our hand motions. The meaning is very clear. If we did get disconnected from Jesus, we die. Except in Hawaii, where we can snap something off of certain plants, stick them in the ground, and they grow quite well. I mean, doesn't this totally mess with Jesus' theology? Maybe not. Hold on. My dad works construction, and most of his jobs, by the way, were out of state. He would be gone for two to three weeks at a time, come home for a few days, and then head back out on the road. I never knew anything different, but, but that doesn't mean that I understood it. When I was little, each time he came home, I assumed he was here to stay. I mean, no matter how many times he had come and gone, this time he was going to stay. He, he wasn't going to leave again. And then when it came time for him to jump into the cab of his big truck and drive away, my sister and I would stand there crying and waving. Phone calls cost a lot, but we would get one if he was gone on a special occasion, like a birthday or something. And by the way, if he was gone an exceptionally long time, he would actually record a message on reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes and mail it to us, and we would get to listen to it. The thing I remember most is my sister and I begging him not to leave. And he, was all, he would always promise that he would be back. But that's not the same as not leaving. So I need to go back a few verses, um, which are out of order in our lectionary because they are about the coming of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to celebrate in a few weeks at Pentecost. But these verses are necessary to help us understand today's text. Jesus had been telling his disciples he's going to die. Then three days later, he's going to rise again. And then after that, he's going to go back to heaven. They don't totally understand what he's saying, but they know enough to say, Jesus, don't go. In John 14, 15, Jesus promises, I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. There are a few verses that are as important as this one when it comes to our faith. Jesus goes on to say, you know, the world won't be able to see me, but you will see me. So can you see Jesus? I mean, I know the world can't see him. In fact, most of the world doesn't want to see him. But as the church, as individual believers, can we see Jesus? When tragedy strikes, the media is always quick to find someone who will say out loud, where was God? And, and all the viewers began to repeat that, something of a question, but others as an accusation. Once the media has got everybody reading, listening, buying, complaining about God, then they find someone who experienced a miracle, someone who should have died but didn't. And... and well, they can't explain why, except it's a miracle and God gets the credit, which means that God was actually there, at least for that one person. So Jesus rose from the dead on the first Easter, and then he showed up at least 10 different times over the next 40 days, after which he gathered them together on the Mount of Olives. He blessed them, and then he rose up into the sky until he was hidden by the clouds. Very little dialogue is recorded, and we don't know exactly how long they were up there on that hill or all the things they discussed while they were walking up there. But one thing we know, some of them begged Jesus not to go. Mary, you know, probably a little clingy, hanging on to him. There are a few things worse than having someone you love, someone who is your world, someone who you hang on every word, leave you, especially if you weren't sure if you'll ever see them again. And them promising to come back is not the same as them not leaving in the first place. For those of you who are older, you know what it's like leaving your mom, your dad, your grandparents, an aunt or uncle, someone who you love with all of your heart and knowing that it may be the last time you see them on this earth. If you live far away and you can't just pop by whenever you feel like there is this stabbing pain in the soul that causes tears to flow, and which is why you are hoping that it is raining so that you do not cause undue stress on the one you love, the one who you may never see on this side of heaven again. So when Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, it's actually a strange statement for several reasons. Number one, 
He's our brother, not our father. And we wouldn't be alone. I mean, St. Paul tells us that Jesus was seen by 500 people at the same time, which means the church is well on its way to growing. But if we dig a little deeper into the scriptures, we find a common theme. See, in Jesus' day, orphans and widows that did not have family uh, to protect and guide them and provide for them were, were extremely vulnerable because they didn't have anyone to advocate for them. Over and over in the Old Testament, God tells his church, it is their responsibility, their calling, to provide for those who cannot provide for themselves and who have no family to provide for them. St. Paul in the New Testament says, when someone does not provide for a family member in need, they have denied the faith and they're actually worse than an unbeliever. God takes this very seriously. Around 700 BC, when God is trying to get the rebellious Jews turned around, he tells the prophet Isaiah that the people need to learn to do what is right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Interesting correlation between faith and deeds. Now, these are not things they do to be saved. These are things that they do so that they know they are saved. In other words, it's a response to the salvation that's already theirs in Jesus. So when Jesus tells his disciples, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, I am coming to you, and then promises the Holy Spirit, he's reminding them of their impending vulnerability because he will not be around physically to fix all the things that they're going to break, and they're going to break a, a lot of things. In reminding them that they are not, nor will they ever be alone, he is assuring them that even when they break things, he will still be with them. In other words, our salvation is not conditional upon us not breaking anything. Now, there's a lesson here. Without our big brother here to protect and defend us, the world is going to attack and persecute us. It's just what they do. And because they cannot see Jesus, they are going to take out all of their pain and suffering and angst out on us. Which is why Jesus tells us that we can repeat, we are not orphans. We are not alone, over and over to ourselves. Oh, and when we break things, relationships, lives, ourselves, we can also repeat, we are not orphans. We are not ever alone. But do we always believe what we're saying? So I'd been a pastor for about three or four years, which means I still thought I knew everything. A couple was getting divorced. Their son was struggling, and they asked if I could talk with him. So they brought him over. They sat outside my office, and he was on the inside. And I basically said, so tell me what hurts. And he started telling me about all sorts of things which had nothing to do with him or his parents or the divorce when... All of a sudden, he says, I don't know what I did wrong that my dad has to leave me. Now, if you didn't know it, pastors have two primary classes on counseling at the seminary. That's three hours a week for 10 hours times two, so a total of 60 contact hours with a professor. And most of that, by the way, is reserved for questions, exams, and quizzes. I immediately told the kid his dad was not mad at him. And the kid said, then why is he leaving me? So how would you answer that? Ten-year-old kid, his parents are divorcing. He assumes it's his fault. He did something that made his dad so mad, his dad has to leave. And no matter how many times his mom, his dad, or anybody else told him that that wasn't true, he would not and could not accept it. So why did Jesus leave? Did we do something wrong? I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that's great, Jesus, except you're leaving. So how is this going to work? Because you just said, without you, we can do nothing. So do you see the problem here? Have you ever tried to do something without Jesus? I, I mean, it's a silly question. I try to do stuff without Jesus all the time. The, the real question is, did I really try to do it without Jesus? Or did I just not invite him to be part of the project? And by the way, does Jesus need an invitation? Or he can crash my party anytime he wants. And is God so selfish that if it's not his idea, then it's automatically wrong? There is a church near the Old Love's Bakery that has a big sign on it that says, Jesus coming soon. When I'm on the mainland, it's quite often where I'll be driving around and I will see a sign that says, Jesus saves. For reason I don't know, when I see such signs, I'm a little embarrassed. Maybe because the Jesus coming soon sign has been up for almost 100 years. So coming soon seems to be taking a lot longer than I thought it would. And when I see Jesus saves, it is such an open statement. I mean, what does Jesus save and why does he save it? I mean, theologically, I know all the answers. 
but I wonder about people that weren't raised in the church. See, such statements are personal. Almost like when you see someone who carved, Jimmy loves Stephanie in a tree, or in the old days when someone would write, Susie, will you marry me, using white coral on the black lava rock as you drove from the Waikoloa to the airport. See, I know that I am saved. And so when I see the statement, Jesus saves, I know that Jesus saved me and that I can just get back to my life now because it's, it's an established fact. But what if I doubt that Jesus saved me or if I have no idea if Jesus saved me or I don't even know who Jesus is? I'm not sure if I saw those signs that I would go to where the sign was and knock on the door and ask them to explain it to me. Perhaps even though I go to church, the part that is hardest for me to accept, and, and it's actually beyond embarrassment and borders on indignation, is that I don't want to admit that I need to be saved. As my two-year-old granddaughter says, I do it myself. And so in spite of all my theological and biblical knowledge, Jesus needing to save me hurts my pride. Now, Jesus compounds this today by saying, you know, without me, you can do nothing. I'm going to skip the whole I am the vine, you are the branches thing because, number one, I'm not a big fan of hand motions. It's never really good at it. And secondly, I've got a definite brown thumb when it comes to growing things. Except what does he mean when he says you can do nothing? I mean, has he ever looked at my resume, all the plaques on the wall, all of the certificates? I mean, my grandchildren think I'm a pretty big deal. You know, when my kids were growing up, I would often say, you know, I'm going to Home Depot or Costco or I need to go to church for a couple hours. Put your shoes on and go with me. They would complain a little and then they would get their shoes on and they would go. It, it was my chance to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with them. Ask them questions. Share some things. Just, just be with them. I would get my work done and we would go home. And most of the time, by the way, they would just play or have fun or run around or do whatever they wanted when we weren't talking. Once in a while, we would run into somebody, especially at Home Depot or Costco, and they would look and they'd say, oh, it is so nice that you came with your daddy today. And my kids would turn and say, my dad can't do anything by himself. And I would just smile and say, you're right. When I have work to do, there is nothing better than having someone along for the ride. Even if they don't do anything, it's still great to have them there. And, and by the way, if they want to claim the credit, I'm more than willing to give it to them. See, what matters is getting the work done, not who gets the credit. Maybe we should keep track of our stories, who we are and what we've done and why we did it and who we met along the way. Not to prove how important and wonderful we are, but, but to start to look for a pattern a pattern that might suggest that God has been using us to get his work done, inviting us to put our shoes on and go for a ride. The meetings, decisions, classes, phone calls, emails, texts, waiting, watching that make up our days. There are moments and events that we are so proud of because we did something and we did it ourselves. Or did we? By the way, this isn't about taking away any credit or making little of what we did. It's about realizing that there is a bigger picture and to realize God is using us to change the world, which, by the way, is both scary and amazing at the same time. It also opens the doors to all the times we did something and nothing seemed to come of it. And we watched and we watched and nothing happened and so we went on our way and began to do something else. Never realizing that after we left, the seed we planted, the stalk we stuck in the ground sprung up and began to grow. See, when I snap off a part of a star of India or tea leaf or pohina hina and stick it in the ground, it begins to grow and I don't need any green thumb. It, to be honest, just grows in spite of me. And here's something I learned. It's still part of the original plant. You see, it doesn't change just because I snapped it off and stuck it in the ground. It is still part of that because if we got a DNA a test done on it, it, it would show that it's part of that plant even though it's now disconnected. It's connected in everything that matters. You see, God wants his creative, loving presence and power to be reflected into this world through us. Sometimes he gets the credit and sometimes he doesn't because the world can't see him. And maybe we realize he was working in and through us. Maybe we don't. But truth is, even when you don't know it or accept it, God is always at work in and through us. And by the way, anything we do that we, I did it myself, I think if we did a DNA check, 
we discover that most of the good things we do, in fact, all of the good things we do, would relate right back to God. Maybe we can't do anything of eternal value without him, but with him, nothing is impossible. And that's what he's trying to remind us of, and that he continues to work in and through us even when we think we're out on our own doing it ourselves. I know it sounds like Jesus is being mean, condescending even, but the truth is he's just inviting us to be part of God's work and make an eternal difference in the lives of people. So when God says, I, I've got to go here or there, and I'd like you to go with me, so put on your slippers and let's go, and we head off, and somebody says, oh, isn't it so nice that you came along with your heavenly father today? We're probably going to respond, well, you know, he can't do anything by himself. And God, because he's God, will just wink and smile and say, ain't that the truth? And amazing things will get done, because that's what God does in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.